I invite you to stand and sing with us. I'll call on the families to come on up now. Britt and Tobias have done this so many times. You know, it's like, come on, let's just get this thing going. 
get up there, let's do this, chop, chop. We, all, we were saying we should do it in the office back in the back because they said, right now, all the kids are quiet and happy. You know? But they look happy. Everybody looks good. It's great. What a crowd. This is good. Very good. Tobias and Brittany, Kyle and Kendra, Nick and Jen, Harley and Brooklyn. Do you thank God for the gift of your child and do you accept the joys and duties of parenthood? Do you promise to bring Finn, Lucas, Paxton, and Tennille up within the Christian community and by God's grace so to live that they will be nurtured by Christian love and surrounded by the love of Jesus? Very good. What names have you given to your son or daughter? So we'll start here. Finn, Lucas, William, Paxton, Aaron, Tennille, Adele. We greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus and welcome you into the community of God's people. Now for your promise. Gathered here as members of this congregation and as representatives of the wider church of God, do you promise to offer Finn, Lucas, Paxton, and Tennille and their family your love and support and being faithful in prayer Will you share your faith with them by word and example? If you'll promise this, please stand. You guys can come forward. Finn, we rejoice. For you are God's gift to us. Grow strong in the knowledge and love of God. We pray that one day you will be a disciple of Jesus Christ. (laughs) That word makes me smile too. (laughs) Following him through the waters of baptism and in a life of faithful witness, bear the fruit of his spirit and live his great gift of love. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Very good. Lucas, we rejoice, for you are God's gift to us. Grow strong in the knowledge and love of God. We pray that one day you too will be a disciple of Jesus Christ following him through the waters of baptism and a life of faithful witness, bear the fruit of his spirit and live his great gift of love. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Paxton, we rejoice, for you are God's gift to us. Grow strong in the knowledge and love of God. We pray that one day we, you too will be a disciple of Jesus Christ, following him through the waters of baptism and in the life of faithful witness. Bear the fruit of his spirit and live his great gift of love. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. The one lady of the group. Here we go. Tennille, we rejoice for you are God's gift to us. Grow strong in knowledge and the love of God. We pray that one day you will be a disciple of Jesus Christ, following him through the waters of baptism and in the life of faithful, faithful witness bear the fruit of his spirit, and live his great gift of love. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. So I'll now be asking uh, the congregation...
um, to do a blessing on them as well. So they're going to go on the congregation. Now, we had all these ideas where you're going to go. I would say go where your mom and dad or your family are, because I noticed they're all kind of in different spots. So you'll just go there. But anybody, feel welcome to come over and bless them. You can just say blessings, or you can pray a prayer. Here's the thing. It's the season of colds. Don't touch their hands or their faces, but please feel free to touch feet and legs or put a hand on a parent and just do a blessing. My voice is coming through there. Yes, very good. <laughs> Finn, Lucas, Paxton, Tennille, these are your friends and family. You are a gift to them and a sign from God that we must all come as little children with empty hands and open hearts. Come and meet them that they may thank God for you. Okay, guys, you go down and people feel free to bless them. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And this Word is the good news that was preached to you. The word of the Lord read in our midst. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for your message to us, your revelation, a, a letter of love to us, Lord, that will help us live and, uh, and be guided in your ways. Lord, we ask that this text would come alive for us this morning and would um, challenge us and encourage us in the ways that we are to go. Amen. Does anyone here remember their first crush? Does anybody here remember their first crush? Some people are going, these young ones are going, yes, that first crush is still happening right now. Their first, uh, do you remember your first love? That first experience of that crazy head over heels, I can't think straight infatuation. Your infatuation was probably with somebody unattainable. The unattainable people are safe to idolize, right? The person was probably either not in your friend group or maybe older than you or was a movie star or a singer. These loves were at a distance, and that's why you read so many good and wonderful qualities into them. They could do no wrong. They were beyond reproach. I remember my first crush clearly. She was the girl who sat one row over from me and one desk ahead of me in grade seven. She was popular, I was not. She was smart, I was lucky to pull out a couple Bs. Every time I tried to talk to her, I got tongue-tied and said something stupid, and she would look at me like I was some newly discovered species. <laughs> so I thought, hey, if I can't win her over with conversation, maybe my athletic prowess would impress her. I tried to catch her attention by climbing tall buildings, that is, onto the school roof. No response. I tried to impress her with my basketball skills. This was better, but still nothing. Then I thought, hey, I know, she likes tennis. Maybe I will challenge her to a game of tennis. I had it all mapped out in my head. I would easily beat her in the first game. I would let her win a few points in the second game. And then, being the generous man that I was, I would let her win the third game. This way, she would see what an alpha male I was, and yet at the same time, how I was a really nice person. So I challenged her with the young man's never fail, never fail charmer. I heard you're not a bad tennis player for a girl. <laughs> this got her attention and she accepted. Not with the doe eyes I had dreamed of, but with the fire in her eyes that I've since learned is not something you want to see in any woman of any age. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I was not a bad tennis player. I often played when I was tired of basketball. What I had not reckoned on was a match with someone who I found out later was a member of a private tennis club and who played all season long. And actually, I believe now I looked her up on Facebook and she's a full-time tennis coach. I wouldn't go so far as to say that I played great, but I did well enough that I earned a sort of grudging respect. But seeing her so determined to hand my head on a tennis racket changed my view of her. I started to see her as a person with good qualities and not so good qualities. I saw that she was nice at a distance, but up close had some serious anger issues. I had a choice. Either I'd follow up my infatuation by seeing her as she was and accepting and loving her, or I needed to move on. I chose to move on. 
Have you ever noticed that when people first come, become Christians and join a church, they have this upswell of love for their new church? It's an infatuation similar to a first crush. It lasts at most for a couple years. They just can't get enough of the church. It's the same thing when people move to a new church, even as a pastor. You know, you're, you get attached to it and you're just all in love with it and it's perfect and you can't do any wrong and it's got all its things all together and everything's working really well. In simple terms, we're infatuated with each other at the very beginning, with the congregation, to the point where the church can do no wrong. The reality is, of course, is somewhat different. If you're new to this congregation in the last year or so, I want to tell you something that may challenge your infatuation. This congregation, while being a Bible-believing and God-fearing church, is not perfect. It's true. Even the pastor is not perfect, nor the elders. We make lots of mistakes. The people here are not always lovable. And they're not always on their best behavior. And when you discover this for yourself, you're going to have to decide whether or not you want to follow up your infatuation with love for the congregation. When you start seeing the not-so-good parts of a congregation, you have to decide whether or not to keep the fantasy, the infatuation, alive by keeping the church at arm's length or get even closer and love them with both their good and bad qualities. And it's so, it's so funny that this happens, this happens obviously in relationships, but I didn't realize how clearly it is the way that church works. And it works, and maybe as a pastor I get to see this especially, is that when, when we first get together, we just, we're the best, right? You know, it's the best pastor, it's the best congregation. But as you get to know me, you realize you had a choice to make at some point where you said whether you're going to love me or not, because you started to see my bad qualities, you know, where sometimes where I can be, I can, I can pound away and, and drill, 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 like I, I, I have a hard time getting off of some things or ideas that I think are good. And you'll know that about me. And what you'll do is you'll go, we know that, and we're patient, and we love him. Harv is just going, yes. He's just nodding the whole time. Yes, I know this. And he still loves me. And that's awesome. And I love him too. And that's, that's what church is about. Church is about moving from infatuation, which is the natural progression, into choosing to love, which means to know the truth of someone. This morning, we're going to examine the characteristics of someone who moves into a love relationship with the church. We're going to examine the characteristics of a Christian who truly loves other believers. The characteristics that are purity, obedience, and of course, uh, but important to state, being born again. First, in verse 22, we read about purity, a foundational characteristic of a love relationship with other believers. Peter, throughout this letter, keeps coming back to foundations, reminding us over and over again what the basis for living life as a Christian really is. Peter has a measure twice, cut once kind of attitude in his teaching. He's going to tell us how we should live, but not before telling us once, twice, maybe even three times how it is we can even contemplate such a life. The danger Peter rightly sees is this, that in telling us how to live, we might think we can do it all on our own, by our own gumption or our own willpower, that we could just love other people, rather than requiring the power of God, partnering with that. Of course, this is the opposite of what Peter knows to be the truth and what he's going to teach. So verse 22 starts with a statement of fact, with a statement of fact, having purified your souls. If we're going to discuss holy living, it's got to begin with the purification of souls. The people Peter is talking to aren't unbelievers, they're believers, they're Christians. And they need to purify themselves. How do they do this? How do they go about doing this? How did they accomplish it? How have they done it through, uh, how have they done it? Have they done it through conversion? Uh, by becoming Christians, is that how they've accomplished it? No, of course not. It is God who purifies us in conversion. It's completely his own power and initiative. We are cleansed when we become Christians. We don't become clean ourselves. So we don't purify ourselves in that moment. So if we have purified our souls, Peter must be talking about their post-conversion growth, uh, cleansing and purification after becoming Christians. Now, purifying your souls is not an end state, so that once you've achieved it, you say, well, I've purified my soul, I am done, I can move on. Conversion's like that, right? We become a Christian, it's done, it's a past event, it's happened, it's done, it will never be undone. 
And now we can, we can trust in that. But purification is something that is, uh, uh, something that is ongoing we, because we never come to that perfect place, that perfect state. So we're always working at it. James 4, 8 says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Obviously, this is exactly what these Christians to whom Peter is writing have done. They have been drawing near to God and they have hands and hearts that have been cleansed by changing the way that they live. If we're going to love others, we must begin with the love of God that saves us and then discipline ourselves to every day come close to God in prayer by reading the word and meditating on the word, by quieting our hearts and listening for his voice. I thought, I think I, I'm having a changing attitude towards this. I think there's a lot of power in daily coming to be in the presence of God that will actually help you live a holy life. First, I thought it was kind of like, well, if you came one day, it wasn't like God left you the next day and you should be able to continue to live the holy life. I'm changing my mind on that one. I think you need to come to God every day. Is that by coming close to God, it says in, that James, in James, right? It talks about as you come close to God, God comes close to you, that you're purifying yourself. This is a daily event. And this will actually help you live the Christian life. You see, uh, loving others is not uh, e an easy thing. We're not going to be able to do it unless we have been recently in the power of God drawing us to a pure kind of living. So loving others is not a starting point then when we, uh, where we can just get right to it after the service is over today. Rather, it's a result of following God and purifying ourselves, growing in holiness by being close to God. It is God and being with God that transforms us into loving people. Verse 22 goes on to tell us that purity is developed through living the second characteristic, obedience to the truth. Now, this isn't the truth as the world teaches. This isn't philosophical truth, right? This isn't a legal code, but it's the truth given to us by God through revelation, for this read, it says, obedience to the truth here includes everything in the scriptures. Uh, living as, uh, it is, includes living as Jesus lived his life on earth, living by the Ten Commandments, the, the Beatitudes, and by the many exhortations found in the Bible. What I mean is this, that as we mature in our faith, we begin increasingly to take the whole counsel of God, the whole Bible, and work to bring our lives into harmony with it. Your whole goal as a Christian is to bring your life in harmony with what you read in the biblical text. Not part of it, not like you can just do the Ten Commandments and then you're done, but rather the whole of it. And, and as we come closer to that harmony with that word, we sense this uh, a strength and a peace and an ability uh, to live as God would want us to live. As those who have been Christians for a number of years and have matured in their faith can testify, obedience to the truth and, and means bringing yourself into submission to it, studying it, living it out, and it's no easy task. Remember I said that Peter measures twice or even three times and cuts once? Skip with me to verse 23. Here is the third characteristic of one who has a true love relationship with those in the church. Love for the church, the body of Jesus Christ, comes about, uh, uh, comes about because we have been born again. It's not the natural state of humans to love those that are not part of our biological family. With our children, there is a natural um, created reality that we love our children. I don't think anybody, I, I think as uh, Craig was kind of mentioning, there was this natural uh, bounce that started when he picked up his baby. He never did it before. And all of a sudden he has uh, the baby in his arms and he starts to do it. I would say that's an indication or, or not maybe a, a major one, but there is one that there's something natural. There's something created, a created reality in us to love and care for children, our children. It's not natural in the other areas. Um, the other people that aren't part of our biological family, we kind of can t leave or take or leave them, right? Um, so to love those in the church, there needs to be a conversion. 1 John 5, 1 says this, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Wow. If there isn't a statement that conversion is the key to loving other believers, this is it. This is the one. 1 John 5, 1. 
Sure, we might have a passing interest in people before conversion, but the, the love that Peter's talking about is far more than interest and is the result of a spiritual change in our very nature. In being born of God, we love others who have also undergone this spiritual change because they're now our family. The spiritual change that leads to us loving other Christians didn't come about because of our effort. While growth and purity involves, to some degree, the sweat of our brow, our spiritual change or being born again comes only as a result of what God does uh, through, uh, as the verse continues on to say, uh, through the living and abiding Word of God. Now, the Word, that is the words contained in the Scriptures and the words spoken by God, is very powerful. The Bible's not like other books, just words on a page, mere ink. It's a living Word. Hebrews 4.12 says that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thought and intentions of the heart. When God speaks a word, as He had in the Bible, worlds are created. Things come into existence. And as we see by our text, people who are dead in their sins are made alive. Christians sometimes make the mistake of thinking there's no innate power in the spoken or written Word of God. We would, I would, you know, and I was that person at one point as well. I would say, I didn't, don't think that there is their power directly in these words. I remember one lady who at the end of my sermon wanted to make that point to me and told me that the Holy Spirit had all the power and the Word, it's, uh, the word of God itself was just a shell in which the Spirit worked. So she took her Bible and put it on the ground and stepped on it. Now, I could have corrected her. I wanted to by simply picking up the Bible. Shh, out go her feet. I could have corrected her that way. I decided not to. But better yet, I could quote this or other texts that clearly show that God's words, the words in their, in their formulation are worthy of our respect. And it's because of them, it's through them that we've been born again, that we're made alive. Verse 23 also says that the Word of God is abiding. This indicates that it's a, a message, this new life that it proclaims through Jesus Christ is a message that will never get old. It will always be relevant and eternal. Even in heaven, when all things have come to their appointed end, we will still celebrate and know the Word of God. We will still celebrate the wisdom and love of God that sent a Savior to redeem us, to buy us back from slavery that would have ended in eternal separation from Him. This abiding Word of God is of greater value than anything else on earth. As verse 24 and 25 elaborate, the things of this world, they may look good, but human beauty and splendor are passing wisps, insubstantial, mere nothings that look to have great value, but ultimately do not. The reality is that their beauty hides life that is already fading, having a wilting and dying core. Everything around us, guys, even our bodies themselves, until they've been redeemed, uh, or not redeemed, but um, uh, we've been born once again into heaven, or our bodies have been uh, brought together with soul, they're, they're, they're dying. They're wilting. They're going away. I am, I am, I'm a dying person. You look up at me at, up here, and I look alive, and I look uh, healthy, kind of, and I look at a number of things, but, you know, you're actually looking at a dying body right now. I'm dying. And I don't know how many years left I have, but I'm a dying body. And the thing is, is that God and His Word, this thing is alive, and it never fades. It never will. It's the only thing that we have on this earth right now that is like that. The Word of God is where loving the church begins. So armed with these characteristics, purity in our souls, obedience to the whole counsel of God, being born again through the living and abiding word of God preached to you, there will be, says Peter in verse 22, sincere brotherly love. A love which includes all our brothers and sisters in Christ. This love is not like the infatuation of the new member who keeps their distance and never goes deeper than, hi, how are you? Kind of relationship on Sunday morning. This would be infatuation, not love. Infatuation does not want to know about other people's lives, their struggles, their heartaches, their pain, their, their challenges, the problems they have in their families, the struggles they're having at work. Infatuation just wants to know about all the good things 
and good times and good fun. When things get tough, a person infatuated with the church just moves on to somewhere else and begins anew. But a sincere love, as Paul says, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Christians with sincere brotherly love are in the church for the long haul. Through thick or thin, through conflict and misunderstanding, through missed opportunities, through rushing forward, through honest mistakes and flaws in personality. Paul says in verse 22 that Christian love is engaged in earnestly. This reminds me of the command to not only give, but to give cheerfully. It goes beyond the law. So we can give, for instance, and we can give cheerfully. So it's like, here's the law, but I want you to go beyond the law. I want you to change the way that you give and the way that your heart thinks about it or experiences it. It goes beyond the law to the spirit. The Greek word earnestly refers to strong, deeply felt, even fervent emotion or desire. God not only wants us to put up with one another. If we only put up with one another, we're no better off than the rest of the world. The rest of the world says, tolerate one another, other than Christians. But it says, tolerate, tolerate one another, put up with one another. If that's what we start doing in the church, we are on the road to destruction as a church. If we just tolerate each other, we have to learn to love each other, even with all of the bad things. Not trying to, well, I'm going to ignore the bad things and focus on the good, but go, I see your bad qualities and I love you anyway. That's earnest love. We may not be best friends. I'm not asking you guys to be best friends. Hear me clearly. You guys, your personalities may not and never get along to be best friends. And that's okay. We just have to love each other. We may have some serious disagreements. We still need to love each other. My friends, this morning as a congregation, we've dedicated four children and eight parents. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep. Eight parents. And I encourage you to take this passage of scripture to heart in light of that commitment. When we dedicate a baby and we bless them, we're committing to passing on and living out a life of faith, encouraging and modeling the characteristics of purity, obedience to the truth, and being born again for these families and these children. Practically, this means, so what are we supposed to do for them? As we're going to model this for them in our lives, and we're going to encourage it in them as well, what does it mean? It means reconciling with each other when there's been division. It means bringing into light that which has been hidden in darkness. It means desiring and seeking after the good of those around you this morning, no matter what things have happened in the past. Let us not be believers who are only infatuated with the church. Rather, let us sincerely and earnestly love the people here at Rosemont Fellowship Chapel and within the churches and the believers in our community. Churches made up of our brothers and sisters in Christ who through the work and word of God are in it for the long haul. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for your word this morning. We just pray that you would allow us to um, get real serious about our love relationship with you. Lord, and demonstrate that by getting into your word and to continue to grow closer to you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. What a perfect song for us to end today. Um, This week is going to be marking the beginning of Lent. Uh, Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday. And usually during Lent, what we do is we give something up. I'd encourage you this this year, instead of just giving something up, add something positive uh, to your life. I'd encourage you to add scripture reading. And try to add that every single morning for the next 40 days as we prepare ourselves uh, for the time of Easter. May God bless you and keep you. Amen.